So Jessica, if you um. You use the bu command. Squirt. Instead of bp. It's kind of goofy because in all other situations, uh, Windy Bug, you know, assumes everything is hexadecimal, but in its assembly mode, you have to prefix with zero x. You guys do it over here. Okay, I can't get the jump to work. Hmm. Um, 
You mean it's like not actually taking the jump, or the jump isn't going to the right place? So, so if you do a DB on that address, one two FD eight zero should be your shell code, right? So yeah, it looks like a shell code. Okay, and have you put those uh, bytes into your payload? Okay. Uh, this should be all right. So, um, so you're doing the uh, bytes backwards, and for those, you don't do them backwards. This is your x86 opcodes. It's only the 32-bit um, addresses that you do backwards. because it's a relative jump. So you have to calculate it when you're on that CC byte, right after the pop pop return. So CC and CC. Okay. C3 is return, CC is software breakpoint. Yeah, uh, so I think this is so I have done it. Okay. Okay. DB on that, actually, I'll press enter one more time, right? So it actually assembles. I'll do DB on the address to make sure your shell code's actually there. Uh, DB on one, two, and P50. Oh, you're pressing So yeah, that's right. Okay, so just take those bytes associated with the jump and hack them where your CC bytes are. So you actually want to put in the bytes for the chip, like E9, and then for the F8. So you're putting the address in there. You want to put the bytes that actually tells the processor to do the job, which is E9, 9 through the And you can see that oh, in the wizard right now, but it was up to that. So those are the actual x86 octaves that mean that it's gel. That is. And then that there too. Yeah. So you were just putting the address there. You had to actually tell the processor. Because at that point, the processor is pointed at those opcodes. And you need to tell it, OK, processor, I'm going to use the x86 opcodes and jump backwards to my shell code. So it looks like you overwrote um, the exception handler function pointer with CCCC. So 
see if a red debit um, up, up return. Yeah. Yeah, because you got to remember the debugger is just telling you, okay, an exceptional condition just happened. Do you want me to like do something about this? Probably let the process try to handle it. Because um, it did the pop pop return, but now it's executing uh, whatever is after your pop pop return. So there's probably, if you open up HFC, you should see an A byte right after that uh, address of the pop pop return. Oh, yeah, it's because um, you put the A's right before, because remember it's going to set the, uh, this, the EIP right before that pop pop return address first. So you have to do the EB06 right there. So if you change that to EB06, it then it should jump to the CC button. CC. Yeah, there you go. I know, the mental endurance is worth then. We're almost home free, though. Now you assemble the jump back to All right, so Sam and Christina and Jessica, how's it going on um, your end? Uh, Sam is uh, talking with Gino to do something. Anyway, so uh, we are doing lab here together. So Gino is working with Sam. Okay. okay. Yeah, Sam, I think a GS protection is turned on this thing, so that ain't going to work too good for you. Because remember, GS protection is going to check the value of that canary placed right before the, uh, the return address, right before it actually uses the return. But with the exception handler stuff, we gain control of EIP before that canary's integrity is ever checked. So just trying to overwrite the save return address would be no way in.
So I'm trying to pack with the jump. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to put the, the bytes of the jump in backwards. The bytes of the jump go in forwards. Oh, yeah. that's yeah. So that's just it's just 32 bit addresses that have to be you know switched in little Indian mode, but that's just telling you when the CPU is pointed at these bytes, that is that will tell it to execute a jump backwards. So you have to make those bytes appear in that order. There's a lot of little things you got to get right with this exploit business, so it's easy to kind of like get one wrong and be like, what the hell's going on? So once everyone's gotten this, um, we're going to start looking at buzzing that old unpatched Windows XP virtual machine. So I'm going to give uh, people like probably 10, 15 minutes more to work on this one. So we'll say, for those of you that are done that don't want to mess with the dead bypass one, you can take a break to like uh, 125. And when we come back, we'll start looking at uh, exploiting some old unpatched Windows vulnerabilities. Is there anyone on the BB cast that wants uh, some advice that's having a hard time with this? One forty five. Then I'll start wrapping this up and moving on to the uh, the Windows XP bugs.
the gunner there for when you pond drain so deeply? Mm, just covering my, saving my files. Yeah. Don't go doing any of your online banking on it. I'm just kind of curious to see what will happen if you try to just browse to like Google in that browser to see what the proxy does. You don't get like an instant instant mint email from the manager. Huh? Probably IE6. Yeah, I had browsed even in this VM, and in this VM, it proxy blocks you. Did you try with Firefox too? No, I didn't realize there's Firefox in here, but I know that they have rules on Firefox versions as well, so unless you put that on there right before you made it. I mean, what you can do if you really want to browse is just like download Chrome and then drag and drop it onto the desktop and install it. Probably not the best idea. Well, I mean, for this uh, for this one, this one isn't so bad. It's patching is turned on these guys. So the debt bypass, you would want to pivot the stack. Pivot the stack to attack the controlled data. You want to create a fax, a fake stack frame there that calls virtual protect. And then the return address for your virtual protect stack frame should be the address of your shell code. How about VBCast people doing? Who hasn't gotten it yet? All right, well, I'll give you guys that are still trying to finish it up till, like I said, uh, 145. Those of you that have already gotten can chillax for a minute, rest your brains, because the last part of the class will be exploiting that Windows animated cursor rendering vulnerability. So I think you guys will like that one. You want to be fresh with it.
What's the news looking like, Corey? I just saw, like, front page of Google News, 32,000 people evacuated as fire doubles in size. Do you have any, like, map that you're consulting that shows what the limits of it are? Yeah, but it's not very up-to-date. It's just, like, from yesterday, the fire is, like, you know, changing rapidly, so it's not all that accurate. Some people did post some pictures. I'll show you guys. I mean, it's getting a lot worse. Apparently, last night, it's basically reached hell on earth proportions. That's what Colorado Springs looks like right now. So, Centennial, I'm on here. My house is like up this way somewhere. Nice I like the comment, yeah. yeah. Good, sums it up. Yeah. I think that right there is the uh, Air Force Academy football field. Yeah. Let's see what the forecast looks like. <laughs> <laughs> He's partly cloudy. <laughs> Mostly cloudy. Oh, yeah. Large Florida's chance of fire. Flood watch, really? It's because all the vegetation has been burned, so if it rains, there's no, uh, you know, vegetation to hold the water in the ground. So, how's this part of the ground? Flood out. Yeah. Oh boy, that's a good forecast for a fire. <laughs> Lightning, that's what we need. I think at this point it's kind of like, so I have like, apartment that I just moved out of and into a condo and I saw a little stuff there and it's probably toasted gone it was like right on the perimeter last night and then I have a condo that's in the southwest part of town and the fire is really spreading northwest so you said you still had stuff in your apartment just some little stuff yeah and just like some crap that I had been and here's where out. giving your girlfriend the keys to your apartment might have been helpful, right? Man, she's not there either. Do you have the keys to her place? Uh, she lives with me. Oh, technically, yes. I think so. That was a couple. It was like a pretty good one. It showed like a satellite image, but it was actually like pretty old. But apparently got really bad last night, and a bunch of homes just started burning, and basically the whole northwest part of the city is on fire. So I'm putting it like 50-50 whether or not my condo will survive. Luckily, there's like this highway, Highway 24, which bisects um, Colorado Springs going east to west, and they're saying that you know they're trying to keep the fire from spreading south past Highway 24, because if it goes past the highway, it's like the whole city is going to burn down, basically. So, if, if they hold that line, then the condo should be okay, and if they don't, the whole city is going to burn down anyway. So, so, yeah, we'll see what happens. It's pretty bad. It's probably the worst fire they've ever had. All right, with that in mind, let's talk about exploits some more. Okay, so uh, those of you that didn't get it, um, I, I document in the slides, like, pretty good how to um, go through the whole process. Um, and once we're done with today, I can stick around a while longer and help you if you still want to keep working on that. 
but I do want to move on to like a, a real vulnerability just to show you guys that, you know, yeah, I constructed this uh, Corey's crappy document reader. And, um, you know, so I kind of made it to, you might say that the bug is artificial since I kind of programmed it to have one. But I just want to show you that this method does, in fact, find like real, real vulnerabilities that have been out there. So as much as I want to show you guys like, you know, a real unpatched vulnerability or whatever, um, the management wouldn't like that so much. So instead, I went and found a, uh, a really cool old Windows vulnerability and it's got like an unpatched virtual machine. And then we're going to, um, you know, try to fuzz that out and develop an exploit for it. So what I want you guys to do is on your desktop, in the um, TSV folder, you'll see like the unpatched XP virtual machine. So go ahead and um, fire that thing up. Okay, so um, yeah, just a reminder, um, no one has any ethical problems with developing an uh, exploit for like a real vulnerability, right? Speak now, I'm forever holding peace. I'm going to talk to my manager, saying Corey ordered me to hack the planet with this bug, this exploit. So everyone's cool with that, right? You guys are all cool with this? So this, uh, this bug has been patched, obviously, but um, you know, I'm sure there's still computers out there running around that don't have the patch applied. So if you make your website contain this animated cursor that I give you, I'm sure you'll have lots of calculators popping up on poor grandma's computer once you go to see what you're doing. Okay. So just an FYI, guys, this bug that we're going to deal with is very aggressive. Like, um, Right. I mean, it's like the rendering of these animated icons, the Windows is very aggressive to it. So if you like browse to a directory containing one of your exploit files or crash files, you're going to crash Windows. So try to do everything from the command line because obviously the DOS console isn't going to try to render any graphics. So for instance, um, I'm sure everyone will accidentally do this at least once. Uh, Trying to uh, change my properties here so the DBcast people can see it a little bit better. Hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, okay, so I'll only show you guys this once, all right? So this is what you should not do. Um, I assume you guys still have it in here. So do not browse to this directory with Internet Explorer. Because you can see I have this animated icon right here, which is kind of be our like original data that we're gonna fuzz. And once you have you know crashes or exploits in here, as soon as you go to this directory um, with Internet Explorer, bam, your host. So if I'm like da 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 uh, I didn't put this one. So yeah, I guess this one uh, uh yeah, does happen. You'll have that happen, it'll just crash Internet Explorer. Now, what I did was, I didn't really know the details of this vulnerability. I was just looking for old, kind of cool sounding um, Windows XP bugs. And all I read was animated cursors, you know, vulnerability in them, and bam. From that, I tried to recreate the bug, figure out what was going on, develop an exploit for it. And that's kind of a good way to, you know, get better at this exploit development vulnerability, vulnerability discovery thing. Is if you see a bug report from a vendor, they're obviously going to be pretty vague. It's going to be like, well, in this product, you know, under certain circumstances, this can happen. And if from that information you go and try to like uh, buzz out or reverse engineer what the bug is and develop an exploit for it, that's a good way to, um, you know, practice these kind of things. So that's exactly what I was trying to do. Okay, so. Um, In this directory, we have this uh, animated cursor, which is going to be the original one that we're fuzzing. So that's like our known good. 
I have this uh, HTML file because the way we're going to set this up is we're going to create like a web page that you know causes the person browsing the web page to have your animated cursor. And if you look at the contents of that, you can see I just have a simple HTML file that forces this animated cursor upon to the poor person visiting your uh, website with this ugly animated cursors. So the way we'll uh, basically fuzz this is I've created this Python script, uh, ANI fuzzer, which is almost identical to what I had you guys use for the uh, CDF fuzzer. And what it's doing is it's pointing Internet Explorer at that HTML file. Okay, and that HTML file is hard coded to load that fuzzy.ani file right here. And then with each iteration of the fuzzer, it's um, opening up the original one, mutating some bytes, and then Okay, so you guys did uh, So I'll get you the password in a second, Wilbur. So it's uh, opening up the original one, mutating some bytes, writing it to fuzzy.ani, and then it's pointing Internet Explorer iExplore.exe at this HTML file, the uh, fuzzyani.html one. And fuzzyani.html uh, is designed, like I said, to uh, make the person display the fuzzy.ani. And then it's going to... Um, log to see if the Internet Explorer crashes when trying to visit that website. Okay? So what's important is um, once you start fuzzing, you will probably end up with some ANI files in your fuzzing directory, which will cause IE Explorer to crash. So if you browse to this directory, you're going to crash. So you need to launch everything from the command line. Like just typing HXD in the parameter to there and notepad to like you know, look at the stuff. All right? Just because even if you do like go to a text pad and do file open and browse to it in here, this little file explorer one, it'll still crash. Because it's still gonna try to, you can see it's even now trying to bring these things. That's how kind of crazy aggressive it is about rendering all these little uh, animated cursors. Okay. So the, uh, the fuzzing method I used for this one, and this was just like my first uh, stab at fuzzing out this bug when I read the original bug report, was instead of randomly flipping bytes, my sort of first approach is usually to sequentially write OXFF in the document. That way it's more deterministic. And I know that you know at OXFF, there are any like integer overflows in there, that's probably going to trigger them. So what this um, fuzzer does is it just writes OXFF in the zeroth byte of the file, first byte, second byte, etc., until it's gone all the way through. So that's what the fuzzer's doing. And that's going to generate some crashes. And so what I want you guys to do is to use the ANI fuzzer. And we'll see what's the directory there. It's in the C colon slash uh, fuzzing directory. And I want you to use that to try to find some crashes and develop exploits for them. Now, before you get started, I want to say this. I've also included in the C colon slash fuzzing directory. This um, heap spray .html file, okay? And what this, this one is similar to the, um, the fuzzy ani.html file, except it's also including a heap spray. And basically what the heap spray is doing is it's allocating tons and tons of JavaScript strings full of your shellcode to completely cover the Internet Explorer heap with your shellcode. And so after this heap spray runs, you can be certain that your shellcode is located at a particular address. So once you gain control of EIP, if you put it the bad.ani file that you're using to demonstrate control of uh, EIP into this heap spray HTML file, and you point EIP at the address 0C, 0C, 
0C, 0C. At that address will be some calculator shell code because the whole point of a heap spray is just to make sure you get shell code at a known address. And so that heap spray is just allocating a ton of JavaScript strings with um, calculator shell code. And then eventually, this address is on the heap, so we know that this address is also going to point to calculate the shell code. Okay, so once you can gain control of EIP via finding a crash in the animated cursor files, put it into the, uh, the heap spray.html, set the EIP equal to 0C, 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 and you should get your calculator. All right, so that's going to be our next lab. So you guys go ahead and start trying to fire up the anti fuzzer and get it going. Now, if I recall correctly, it might already be in sort of like a crashy state. Yeah, this uh, permission denied fuzzy.ani. So um, I think I actually sent you guys the VM hey, when I took a snapshot when I had already like crashed Internet Explorer. Sometimes when you crash iExplore by browsing into the wrong directory, um, it'll cause like a lockup like this because there's like handle looping and so forth. So you might have to restart the VM if you start getting this error, and then try again. So let me see if that fixes it for me. So if you're really mean, you can put this on someone's desktop. Yeah, right. I mean, they'd be totally used. I guess you would have to like boot into you know like recovery mode and only delete it. Also, if you have like any Internet Explorers open or anything like that, it might not let you uh, start the um, fuzzer because it's going to be trying to render those ANI files that you're writing over during the fuzzing process. So reboot, just open command.exe. See, it's like, you know, drawing this dumb cursor each time because it's fuzzing your stuff. So, yeah. So, Wilbur, the, um, the password should be in that um, email I originally sent you guys about where the DMs were located. I believe it was something like mega vulnerable with uh, the E and the mega at three or something like that. Maybe uh, Zeno and Veronica, you guys can confirm that because I think you guys downloaded the virtual machine. Um, you should let it get like uh, 15 crashes, I believe. So the uh, the two phases of this lab, guys, are going to be to um, use the heap spray.html file to turn your ANI file into a weaponized exploit against Internet Explorer. And then once you have that working, I want you to try to exploit it. Um, without using the heap spray, so embedding the shell code in the ANI file itself. And so that way, if you were to just browse to a directory or a file share containing that ANI file, you would get exploited. Normally, if you did that, it wouldn't work because it wouldn't launch the you know, Internet Explorer HTML render and get you your heap spray. But this way, like you said, if you just put it on someone's desktop, then blam, all kinds of stuff would pop up on it. Okay, let me uh, let me look at these and see if we've gotten all the ones that we want. Notice that I'm not 
clicking through the directory to get to my crash log file and doing it off from the command line. Okay, you guys, after you have like nine or ten crashes, you have everything that you need. Yeah, after you've gotten ten crashes, after you've done 224 iterations, you're good to go. And I want you to step through there, try to figure out what the um, what the vulnerability, you know, which crashes are vulnerable, which ones aren't. Some of these other ones actually might be vulnerable, and I just don't know it. I didn't really. Some of them look vulnerable, I just didn't really waste time on them. I just went to the one that looked like absolutely the most exploitable to me. We can have a race to see who gets calc.exe popping up in Internet Explorer first. So remember the steps that you went through to analyze the CDF crashes for exploitability and the steps you went through from turning one of those crashes into an exploit. And that's what you should be doing here. After a while, I'll obviously start working, I'll obviously start working the process myself to help other people, but I want to see how far you guys can get with the training you've already had today with exploiting the crappy document reader. And like I said, since I just sort of invented this lab for the last class, like on the last night, I don't have slides for this. So I can't really cheat by looking forward in the slides. <laughs> oh, so yeah, I should show you guys this. Um, so once you get a crash, to, um, to look at it best, you should, uh, first of all, just to, like recreate it. You can type iExplore.exe. And you need to do the absolute path to the HTML file. So for instance, okay, fuzzy.ani. This is hard coded <coughs> into the HTML file, this path, fuzzy.ani. So I need to replace this fuzzy.ani file in the C colon slash fuzzy directory with the ani file that generated the crash. So for instance, if I'm going to look at crash one. I would copy crash docs crash one dot ani to fuzzy dot ani. Yes. Then I would do i explore dot exe and then the absolute path. This has to be the absolute path, guys. You can't just type whatever like HTML for whatever reason. So i explore dot exe c colon slash fuzzing slash fuzzy ani dot html. And this should crash when I press enter, presumably. Oops. Oh, yeah, actually, um, what might happen, actually, is if you just do it without the debugger, it might generate an exception, but not actually crash, because Internet Explorer is pretty good about catching its own exceptions and then recovering from them using if its exception chain is uncorrupted. But if I were to do it in WinDebug and actually run it, you can see that I do get the exception here. It's just that when I run it on the command line, um, Internet Explorer's exception handlers are actually somehow dealing with this and you know fixing it and allowing the process to continue. So you can see this first one crashed the user 32 read icon guts. What do you guys think about this one? Does this one look exploitable? First crash? Probably not. I mean, just right away without not even looking at anything else, we have a pointer dereference, and it's not even to a full 32-bit register, just to like a one-byte value, so probably not interesting. And we could even do like a U 
EIP to look at what else is around there. So we got the line we're crashing on. Then, um, all right, it's moving that bike somewhere else. Then, let's see, where else is, uh, so EDI now points to our bike. So, eh, nothing looks too good there. Not too interested in this crash. Corey, can you make the text bigger in Notepad? Yeah, just about to do that. So out of curiosity, um, for the vulnerable crash, looking at these crashes, uh, which crash did you guys think is the, uh, the vulnerable one, or one of the vulnerable ones? You got five? Five and seven? Or five, yeah, five. Okay, so five. Yeah, that's one. Got a lot of people saying five. Okay, so why did you guys pick out five? Because of that EIP. EIP is jacked. All right, so that's that's usually a good sign. Um, do we have any other any exception handlers changed? Let's see that five. So in mine, it looks like the exception handler still looks legitimate. This one right here, maybe it's one you're talking about, actually crash six. Remember the number is uh, at the end. So the exception handler is um, screwed up here, so that's a good sign. This one crashed in a rep move SD though, so okay, interesting. Um, Any other one? Any other people pick out a different crash besides five and six? Nine, seven, Dave. Okay, why don't you pick seven, Dave? What were the things that kind of tipped you off? This is, this would be a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Now, were you able to? Um, so one thing you should look for, obviously, when you're looking at these crashes is, all right, reproduce. Do you control the data that's the source of the MIM copy? That's a question you should be trying to answer. OK, we had someone suggested 9, too, I believe. Or was it actually, so this is the one? I like 5.
So with five, you can get the. I was able to get the upper four bytes of EIP. Okay. I mean, yeah, you know, the upper half word. Okay. So you can still make that work with the heap spray, maybe. Not me. That's that's just the first attempt, maybe. Because maybe with the heap spray, Shofu should probably still exist at address like zero C zero C. <laughs> zero, 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 zero. This is that keeps trace reading your shell code everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe you were suggesting nine down here? Or ten, rather? Oh, no. I got the end of the end of it. Okay. Yeah, I'm the so one thing, <laughs> of, one thing that I don't like about ten that I would see about this is that. Yes, mm, Writing right to the right. heap, okay. The heap stuff is kind of gnarly. Like you probably, I'm pretty sure you can actually exploit this. It's just I haven't talked much about how you actually exploit heap overflows. So, and I know in general that stack overflows are easier to exploit than heap overflows. So, if I have a stack overflow, then I'd probably just go for that one. Five is five gives you complete EIP. Five gives you complete EIP control. Mm -hmm. So this one right here. Yep. All right. Offset C zero on the file. Well, let's see it with some calculators popping up. Five isn't the only one though, guys. There are other crashes in here. Also, can be turned into exploits. So don't just uh, abandon ship and start switching on to five. Like actually, I think when I did this. Um, with the other class, I believe I use seven, but I not a hundred percent on that. But you know, five looks pretty good, and six looks pretty good too. Six looks good for the points that you know Veronica pointed out. The exception handler is all jacked up, and um, you know it's causing an exception in Red Move SD, so that's you know a good sign too. The only question you have to answer is, okay, do I control the source operand? Is this data that I control? This 30 B00 and all this jazz. Do I control the data that's over in the exception handler? Now, when you pick this vulnerability, you pick a specific one. You pick it for a specific reason, or were there a couple? I mean, there was a ton I can choose from, obviously, in like an unpatched XP machine, but this one just sounded pretty cool. Well, I was just curious, like, there's a particular vulnerability here that you were targeting that drew your attention to this. But I didn't really know what it was. All I knew was that the, the uh, bug report said, I mean, I could have read more into it, but I didn't want to, just to kind of challenge sure. myself. Sure. And all it said was, you know, buffer overflow possible and Windows XP rendering of animated icons. And so I said, okay, first thing I need is let's go download an animated icon. How do I make Internet Explorer render an animated icon? And then just start buzzing that animated icon. That was literally the first animated icon I downloaded. Good choice. Yeah. I think I even just did a search in, in Windows, the unpatched uh, VM for, you know, star.ani. I was like, first one to come up or something. Corey, how long the heat spray usually takes? Yeah. Um, Fifteen, twenty seconds. Probably more like actually 10 or 15 seconds. seconds. Like if you just open up. Yeah, I mean, you could even test it out by like um, moving the original one in there, like original dot ani fuzzy dot ani. Uh, and then um, doing an I explore on just the heat spray dot html. Okay. 
can see that one only took like five seconds. Okay, thank you, because mine was taking too long. And you can actually verify that you can verify that shellcode is actually there by uh, doing like and breaking and then you zero C zero C. And these uh, other zeros, these bytes you see, these are effectively no ops that it's doing. And the reason why um, it, it uses this is because this heap spray is interesting because you know you're, after this heap spray occurs that at address 0C, 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 0C is a knob sled and then your shell code, like if I kept doing other symbols, eventually I would see like standard uh, calc.exe shellcode. But also the no ops you're using are represented by 0C, 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 0C. So if there are any function pointers on this on the heap when you do this, you know, it's kind of like a super easy broad sword way kind of to exploit things. If you know that you're overwriting some function pointer on the heap, do a heap spray, it overwrites function pointer 0C, 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 0C. 0C and hey, that actually points at your uh, your shell code too. Okay. Kind of why they choose that magic value. It's both a no op, a pointer to you, and a pointer to your shell code. So, so with five, it was trivial to get the calculator up. Okay. So you can um, try a couple of the other crashes, or you can try another thing you should try to do is um, embed the shell code into the .ani file, so that way you don't need the heap spray to get the calculator to run. Because right now you could only exploit someone if they're visiting your website, you know, and there's like HTML rendering happening. But say you want your exploit to work if someone's just browsing to your transfer folder or something like that. That way you can just dump the shell code. Everything is self-contained in the ANI file, and if they browse there, bam, they get calculators here. And that'll be a little bit more difficult. Each spring makes everything, you know, easier. Yeah. It's also another way that ASLR is defeated um, in, in the wild exploits, just because even in the presence of ASLR, you know that if you allocate your shell code a bazillion times on the heap, that 0C, 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 0C is still going to point your shell code. Or a raw payload, or something like that. For you guys that uh, did this, did you do a pop pop return that it jumped to 0C, 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 or did you just point? No, I just put in 0C, 0C. Yeah. And number I, five? Oh, you're just oh, yeah. you're putting that in the. Uh, so with this one, yeah, I should have clarified this. With um, XPSP0, it didn't have this safe uh, software depth and everything, so it doesn't care where you point the exception handler at it originally. It will totally accept it. So you don't have to do like a pop pop return. Yeah, maybe, yeah, I think that I'm having it jump to other parts of the code. Yeah. And, they're and it's just because that was so widely abused that Microsoft decided to, you know, make it, you know, two steps harder to abuse their exception handlers for whatever reason. I think it was really the uh, the code red worm that prompted them to sort of make their exception handlers a little bit more hardened, even though it doesn't really matter, so you just have to do like another extra step. Just since the uh, code red exploit was using these exception handlers to um, be really reliable, basically. For those of you that are, you know, feeling pretty comfortable with this material, I challenge you to like go and find some more bugs in the uh, old one, unpatched XP virtual machine. Just because it's you know kind of good practice and it's fun. Like I think, for instance, their true type font rendering and parsing 30.ttf files contain vulnerabilities at this point. So you can try to fuzz those. I mean, there's a ton in this, in this virtual machine for you to try to fuzz out. Okay, Corey. So I don't know if you said anything, but I had my headset off while we were talking about stuff. So the one thing which I'm not clear on is. So I get that, you know, you want to, whenever you control the EIP, you're going to point it at the 0C, 0C, 0C. Then you're going to hit a NOP sled. 
I'm what I'm not getting is how does your yep. calc shell code get to the end of that knob sled? Um, so the calc shell code is, I mean, the, the heap spray code is designed to like put zero C, zero C, zero C, like a bazillion times, and then a calc So to be clear, to, like, built into all of that obfuscated JavaScript inside the heap spray is already encoded the bytes for a calc shell code. It's not that we're controlling the calc and putting it somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Okay, just wanted to make sure on that. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, and obviously, I actually just got that heap spray script. There's like an automatic heap spray generation uh, applet or whatever, and it tries to like obfuscate the JavaScript somewhat. You know, so it's not quite so obvious what's going on. But, and that's probably why the uh, the calculator is not very obvious, obviously appearing in the JavaScript. Okay, so um, for anyone who wants to follow along, I'll try to. Uh, See what I can do based off of the number five crash. That you guys seem to like that one a lot. Dave, how's it going with you? So first of all, I'll copy um, crash docs crash five dot ani to fuzzy dot ani. So that's the one that the HTML file is uh, trying to use. I'll go ahead and just run it in a Windy mode to see what happens, you know, see what I can see. Okay. And I get that EIP equals zero zero two zero 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 zero. So I'm like, hmm, is that some attacker controlled data? Well, the stack is totally screwed up, so I can't really tell. So you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and just go in shooting blind and see if this um, value even appears. You know, is, is this attacker controlled data in one sort of like a you know rough way to try to figure that out is to see if this value appears in the um, ENI file. Right? Maybe it's something that you know, I thought I was actually you know, like, writing an exception. Okay. Yeah, I'll close that, you know. Okay, so let's see what we can see. Let's open up that thing in HXD. Okay, well, let's try to search for that. Sequence of bytes. What was it? Zero, zero, two, zero, 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 zero. So presumably these would appear backwards. Zero, 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 two, zero, zero, zero. Little Indian, right? Okay, so right there. So what I'm going to do is I suspect there are other instances of this value, so I'm just going to replace each instance with like a placeholder value and see which one ends up being EIP, if this is even the thing that's overriding EIP. It, it may or may not be. So I'll just say one. Uh, okay, and there's one. Now here's another. Another. Okay, so it looks like there was like six of them. So based on the results of um, what EIP is after I rerun this, we should know which of these is overriding EIP, if any of them. Okay, so the first one. All right. So 
I'm going to come back here and replace this with the address of um, the heat spray address. And making sure, yeah, heat spray.html is already programmed to use fuzzy.ani as well. So if I run it with the heat spray.html, it's going to put shellcode at that address. 0C, 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 and we should have calculated something. Okay. All right. Bill, could we get the um, the Windows updates on the uh, display machine to go away? Okay, and for those of you that wanted to use like a different crash, um, let's see, we have some people using was it Crash Seven? Okay, so I'll, you know, I, I don't think I've done this one, so I'll just go ahead and give it a, a stab. So I'm going to try to reproduce this for Crash 7 as well. And okay, so I put... Um, I copied crash seven to fuzzy.ani and I'm just gonna run Internet Explorer against it and see what kind of what the crash looks like. Okay, so I'm dying in a red move SD, that's good always. And um, all right. Hmm. Once again I want to set a breakpoint um, before the mem copy is called, so I can analyze those arguments to the mem copy. So it looks like my return address is 77E7446F. So if I look at um, if I unassemble backwards from that address, I should see the call to the mem copy or a read file pointer copy. I guess is a uh, was actually crashing there. So what I'll do is I'll set a breakpoint here and try to see like what kind of parameters are passed to this function. I really don't even know what it does. But uh, maybe we can sort of discern what it does by analyzing the parameters that are passed to it. I'll do a dot restart. Set a breakpoint on that address. Okay, so um, what do I see here? It seems to be let's see what's at these parameters one, three, B six, F zero. Not really sure, might um, be like this destination operand. Alright, some weird uh, parameter stuff. I can see if either of these appear in the file. Maybe that will tell me something. So I'll search for this first one, the first parameter that was pushed on. Alright, so it doesn't look like the first string of data is appearing. But I suspect that's like a destination operand, so let's uh, search for the other stuff that was pushed on. So, 
So this crash, eh, I don't know. It's not looking too good. Not really sure if we control um, the source operand. Let me see if I can analyze a little bit further, though. Oh, we're going to hit this one a lot, unfortunately. This particular breakpoint. So I'm going to try to look based on where the ESI register is pointing to see what the source operand was for the actual uh, MIM copy. So this is just right here where ESI is pointing. So E four eight three eight six. Okay, so it was crashing because nothing exists there. Maybe if we go a little bit back, we can see what was supposed to be there. A zero. So looks like we don't really control the source operand that's used in the mem copy. So I'm not really excited about that crash. And it might be exploitable for you to screw around with it some more, but yeah, I don't know. Um, which one was that I just looked at? Was that crash six? Seven. So let's see, what else can this crash seven tell me? So on crash seven, the exception handler is um, intact as well. So that's kind of a, like another strike against it. Um, so let's look at Crash 6 instead. So with Crash 6, let's see what we're about to get into. Uh, exception handler is blown up. That's a good sign. Crashing and rep to move SD. That's a good sign. Um, Okay, cool. Let's run a windy bug, see what we see. Exception handler is all blown up. Um, Let's see what the so the exception handler is getting overwritten with this stuff. 0303B00. So let's see if these bytes appear in our uh, in our file. Okay, that looks promising. So I'll replace these with placeholder values. Got it again, unfortunately. Try again. Maybe this time I'll just let it go and see if. Uh... Okay, so that was the exception in our overriding port four 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 four. So if I come back to where that was, again. Yeah, 
can see that Internet Explorer is totally freaking out because it's sort of crashing it with this uh, animated cursor rendering. So I'll change this to zero C. Dang it. Zero C, zero C, zero C, zero C. Run it in my heap spray framework. I don't think you've shouted Papa Legba at all throughout this class, so give me one good one with emphasis. Yes, you do. If you run it without the uh, the debugger, that's what happens basically. Oh, the heap spray one? Yeah. <laughs> You know I would, but my enthusiasm for Papa Legba is a little bit on the down low right now with my condo, you know, about to go up in flames. So if my condo is still there when I get back, I'll let loose a, or if I see the flames raging towards me, I'll try to summon his dark Haitian voodoo, save my condo, because then I really will need Papa Legba to hear my call, put out the fire. So for those of you that got the calculator to pop up, um, class has pretty much been completed. Hopefully I've demonstrated to you that you can develop Windows exploits, bypass mitigations, and use these methods to find vulnerabilities on your own and develop exploits for them. Hope that you're all convinced of that at this point. I just encourage you to be responsible with your newfound powers. Okay. Remember, don't go to my manager and say, Corey made me do it. <laughs> <laughs>